Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to today's Reddit quickie from the subreddit HFY, called, called The Hollow One, written by Regal Legal Eagle. The link to the original will be down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy. Out! As they screeched the word over the speakers, I moved forward. Eyes cast down to avoid the glare of the massive floodlights that had focused on the transport. Going from the darkness of the transport into the bright lights of the camp was always a harsh on my eyes. I tried to keep my ears folded back as best as I could too. The lessened the harsh screeching. All around the edges of the crowd, they were picking and prodding, and the others were with the shock sticks. I had learned to keep with the middle, head down, move forward. I couldn't fault the others for not knowing what to do. They were fresh, terrified and weary from the long trip with minimal food and water. Most of our people didn't survive through the single camp. This was my fault. I rarely look straight into the captors these days. They hurt my eyes, much like the lights. They were so red, both in natural color and heat, angry. So angry, so angular as well. Their bodies seemed to form jagged sharp edges and angles that one might think of be a machine if they did not know better. They were easily twice as tall as our average and far more aggressive than any of our kind. Even our hunters, like me, who had been at the back of the blessed home, was no concern to them. When they came to our dark paradise, they brought lights, machines, and fire. The jungle burned away to reveal their precious minerals, and those who had been unfortunate enough to get caught were sent elsewhere. We have small hands compared to them, and a thumb on either side of our palms so that we considered us useful for tinkering and scavenging. They send us to break down the old operations of theirs, be it mining or conquest. Once we passed the first line of the big lights, I glance around, opening one set of my eyes at a time to view the new place that every way that I can. It's dark and grey right now, cold and dry, but I do see a few scratchy white images in the distance. There is some power left then. It's a dead city, one of their conquests. But I had not seen one with the power left. This is the contrast of the scars that I see in the massive buildings that look very old. Their enemy must have been smart then, to make devices which hold some electricity in them still. The next line of lights is on us, and I look back towards the ground, watching my feet while I shamble forward with the others. I can hear the whimpers, cries, and the gasps, but I do what I can to ignore them. They are worried about their families, trying to stay together. I do not have this pain anymore. It is a luxury of survival to know that I am alone. Apart, apart! They began to screech. They mean for us to get into the lines, but they don't bother learning more than a few words of our language. I shift into the far left line. Most try to press to the center. This is a mistake. The jobs at the center of the camp do not involve leaving the camp. You are entirely stuck within the walls. But if you are at the edge, you will be sent to your outside. And you have more chances. I was lucky in this in the first camp. It was hard to tell how long it had been since the first camp. In the clutches of angry red ones every day of survival seems to stretch far beyond what any day should be. I doubt that I'll see any familiar faces from the horrific learning experience. Of course, as I thought back to Hammerjock, showed his mirth of the joke that his life and revealed to me a face that I've never expected to see again. He was a four ahead of me and in his new line, a friend from back before we had any awareness of the angry red ones. Another hunter possessing three sets of eyes. I opened all of my own to witness him in every spectrum, and there was no mistaking the spectral visage. True sight, heat, and spark of life that were the same one. We had barely survived that first camp, but been split up for the second. I never expected to see him again. I quickly crushed a flare of hope that had started to rise up within me. Hope is not for the survivor. Determination and hatred, these are for the survivor. He sees me and twitches his ears to the right. His thumbs trace a line in the air for me to watch. 
I look for the girl that he indicated. I see her. She's near me. She looks terrified and young. I see some resemblance in the true sight and the spark of life. Family. But she's heading to the inner line. Mistake. Before she gets too far, before the guards notice, I reach out and strongly grip her arm and jerk her into our line. She gasps and whines, but when she tries to look back, I shove her head forward. She stumbles into the person before us and stumbles as well, but my friend is prepared and holds up the rest, so the next line doesn't jam. Move! I hear the screech and continue walking. Why did you do that? I hear her gasp. Her voice was soft and sweet as a ripe voolish. How long has it been since I've heard such a softness in this life? Too long. She will likely be dead soon. Softness does not survive well. Friend ahead moved, I croaked, my voice feeling rusty and unused. I talk very little these days. Her eyes are wide blinded in the harsh lights. She's so terrified she's seeing in color and heat together, further confusing her surroundings. Most of our kind are without a third set, and to see the spark of life is a great honor and a privilege. To us, it means that we are better scavengers for the Red Ones. We trudge along and the line takes shape. We are march past the watchful eyes of the Red Ones and their machines. I'm more curious than anything. Each camp has been different. The first, we had to build ourselves. The others, we merely took down at the end. They always make up reasons for why we are scavenging, and why we must dismantle the camps for parts. The power of the Empire, or how unworthy we are anyway, but I know really why. They are hurting. Any such talk must be extremely careful. They will kill us for far less. But I have heard it, and I see it. The Red Ones are not as big as the others that I've seen. Big as they are, the camp too moved before we were done and they made us move quick, not to mention that they make us scavenge. What great empires need to scavenge? I wish I knew more, but this is enough. The forbidden knowledge has given me a goal. My family is gone. Until now, I thought my friends were all gone too. I simply seek to survive to see them hurt, to see their pain. I fear the voice of Lergeg and the whisper to me and the pain was not enough. But before I know any satisfaction, I must see them in pain. At least once, as I am thinking about that, we enter a larger enclosure around the buildings. It's an old building, part of the ghost city around us. I'm in shock to be given a structure such as this for our barracks. Truly, I'm hesitant for a moment, but the lion is still moving and I must keep up. I will not get into the inside yet. We are lined up before this building. I see one of the large red ones, more impressive than the others. Something odd, however, as I slowly blink my other eyes. His heat is different than I would expect. His sparks of life less regular than the others. He is nervous about something. Then they bring out a traitor. I hate them more than I hate the red ones. They have seen what they do to us. The red ones think of them as no better than disposable tools. Yet they think themselves to be better than the rest of us, that the Red Ones value them. These things are not true. Normally, the Big One will speak about the task while the Extrator explains. This time, however, was a bit different. What do I tell them about the city? The traitor asked in a tongue that the Red Ones, all close as they could get, no matter how hard one of us might try, their throats were not the same as theirs. Very few of us could understand the language, and I had survived long enough to know it. It is dead, but dangerous. Tell them to report anything with light. The red one was curt. No swearing or growling. Just one very unusual. Should I mention them? No. He growled out, proving that he was unusual, but not completely different. What were they concerned about? The traitor began to explain our job then. Just as I expected, we were going to be heading out into the camp, into the city and the surrounding area to scavenge pieces and parts for their empire. This time, he did add that there was many dangerous devices left over from the vanquished enemy, and that we should have learnt them should we find any working lights. How much we got to eat would depend directly on how much we found. Good behavior would be rewarded, bad behavior would be punished. 
In reality, I knew that we would be punished no matter what, but some of us would lose our dignity and do whatever asked, and in turn simply be punished less. I did not voice this, of course. Instead, I listened to the traitor and the big red one when the traitor spoke and the captor's tongue once more. I think we should warn them. They'll be out where it strikes. No, the big one was firm yet again. Tell them that they will line up now for the tattoos in the first assignment. Once the traitor was done translating, the big one spoke again. Tell them that I will now demonstrate how serious we are about obedience. Yet again, the translator translated, and I knew what was coming. He did not. The big red one pulled out his death spark free of his side and shot the traitor in the side of the head. Most of the others screamed in terror, but I didn't flinch. In fact, I watched in all three spectrums. True sight heaked and spark of life. As awful and as terrible as it can, I can seldom turn away from watching this happen. The painting it creates across my vision is beautiful in a terrifying manner. While the heat and the spark of life fade from the body, everyone began moving to the side for their tattoos. I watched for another few seconds before turning to follow the others. I did not fight for the front, but I did not fall back too far. I had to remain near the girl to make sure that she stayed near the middle as well. As we began to get funneled through another set of blade wire, I could hear some of our captors. Which ones do we take for tonight? They said that our meat shipment is late. I quietly leaned forward, close to the girl, eyes focused on her neck. I like them younger. They taste better. Keep your eyes out of something really fresh. When I heard that, I coughed, trying to cover up the fact that I was reaching into my mouth to pull free some garish berries that I'd hidden under my tongue. I crushed them in my hand and smeared the remains of the girl's neck. What are you doing? She gasped out. No words. I quickly chided and finished smearing the greenish remains about the back of her neck. Just in time, too, as I straightened up and we walked past the butchers. That one? Ah, never mind. Seems like she might have that disgusting rot thing that they get sometimes. Oh, but the other one looks good. Behind us, they pulled someone else from the line. As the others heard the commotion, the girl tried to turn. I just jabbed her in the side and kept her moving forward. Things slowed down once we got to the chairs. Anyone who spoke loud enough to be heard got a shock, so we waited in silence after the others figured out that. We all waited for our turns. The girl was just before me, and I heard her gasp as the wine of another prisoner administered the ink. Then it was my turn. I sat down in the chair and placed my arm where I knew it must go. The prisoner looked at me for a moment and then at my arm, gasping as she noticed three other tattoos. She was young, though not fresh like the other girl. I'm so sorry, she whispered. I live. If you also wish to live, do your job. Do not focus on our pain. Focus on your survival. My reply was honest, if a bit blunt. She nodded and shifted the machine before activating it. I let out a slight hiss as I felt the needles yet again. Some other device rubbed against back, leaving behind the same number on my clothing. But soon it was done. I had another number, a new name for the captors to growl out. My fourth such number. I got up and moved with the others towards the tools. Most of our people were simple farmers. They moved towards the tools that they recognized. Large, heavy mistakes. I prodded the goal away from the others towards my friend. When she saw him, she began to move quickly, but backed off and motioned for her to stop, quietly whispering, We must not appear to know each other. They will separate us. Then he moved around to the other side of the tool pile. I picked up a small case that I knew well, fine work tools, and I would have to earn my keep with these, but I could do far better than in the right conditions. I hoped that the city involved those conditions. For the girl, I motioned the cutters and strippers. Wiring was dangerous for those who could not see the spark, but I could show her, and she could have a decent job. Once everyone had tools, we were split into groups. My friend and I were careful not to make obvious that we were shifting to ensure that we'd be in the same group with the girl. The red ones didn't notice. Then off we went to the ghost of the city. Here, and there I noticed the wine fuzz of life spark in the old machines. This city was an interesting salvage job. Clearly, the old buildings were still full of materials, but they weren't after simple raw materials this time. 
They shouted and shocked at the edges of the group to keep us moving until we reached the building with which more sparks of life in it than I'd seen so far. They yelled at the people once more and began to set up the posts around the building and got everyone to work. Most of the people had started dismantling the structure, which was very hard work. As I knew that they'd picked up the wrong tools, I pushed inside with the girl, showing her to a room that the red ones had started on already. There was no power in the room, and I quickly showed her how to strip and cut the wires that she needed to pull out the wall. I began to dismantle the metal boxes left behind by whoever lived here before. The red ones would patrol so that I would be careful to keep the work level looking consistent. Too slow, and they would beat you too fast, and they would set up your expectations too high. The key was to pace yourself. Do what you can to be useful, but unnoticed. A narrow path to walk, for that first day it was easy to settle into the usual groove. We were indoors, the temperature was a bit cool, but not too bad, and these guards didn't seem bored as usual, so I wasn't beat at all. As I disassembled the metal boxes, I would give the girl more wire to make it seem that she had done more work, though I was careful to only add to it when the patrols weren't in the room. I was a little surprised when we were told after about nine hours. A short work day for the red ones. A planet seemed light still, and they didn't seem to fear the dark before. I wondered why we were stopping. Either way, we gathered our findings and assembled as a group. The guards would mark what we'd found before we dumped it into the floating trucks. After that, we were assigned rations based on how much we got. I did not get the most, but I did better than many. This was the idea. Then we were herded back to the barracks. When we were ushered inside, I nearly gasped. This was a palace. The walls were still intact, and they looked like they had insulation. The bathrooms had cold running water, and bowls that would make water away and replace it with new water. It also looked like there was almost enough bunks for everyone. It would likely only take a week or two before everyone had left their own bunk. I couldn't believe how nice this place was. What was going on? Suddenly, I began to feel suspicious. Why were the red ones letting us use such a nice building? I felt uneasy and chose a bunk in the far corner near the broken window. It would be colder and the others avoided the area. But the red ones came for us in the night. I might be able to get out of the way. The broken glass would only cut me a little. I settled into my bunk and see the girl approach. This corner is cold. Why not join us further in? It's a bit crumped and much warmer. I stared at her. All my eyes were open to observe her being as she stood there and I kept quiet. For some reason, she was more stubborn than I expected for someone so soft. It took three minutes before she finally turned and left, sounding frustrated. Fine, be that way. I saw my close friend choose the bunk at the edge of the corner that I was in, close enough that he might be able to get to the window, but also not too far from the girl. He needed to be careful. Such sentimental decisions could be dangerous. When no one else came to my corner, I took a thin blanket from the lower bunk, and the pillow as well. Normally, I did not get such a luxury for several weeks. To my surprise, nothing happened in the night. Morning came, and with it the usual morning gruel. The stuff was warm. I can't figure out what was going on. This place was too nice for the red ones. We returned to the same building as the day before, and I got to open up the metal box that I'd been working on and freeze once the lid was off. There is a knife inside. I quickly close the lid and look around. A red one in the hall, I pretend to fiddle with my tills until he moves on. I open the lid again. The knife is still there. It was not there yesterday. It is small but very sharp, and it even folds into itself, and a little latch to hold it closed. A knife. How long has it been since I've had such a tool? So many of the farmers fail to understand how useful a blade like this can be. But a hunter knows, and I'm unsure if this is a test. I decide that it is not my hand moves over the box. The knife vanishes and I hide it away. The girl clearly has no idea what has happened. Was this a gift? I slowly look around the room. All eyes open, I see nothing. I hesitate before getting to work. The boxes still need to be disassembled. Since we got back to work much faster today than yesterday, it is a ten-hour day but it is still light when we are told to stop. They must be afraid of the dark. 
I do not understand why. It makes me both curious and nervous. This camp will perhaps be the easiest that I've lived in. A year or two here will be not hard to survive if I play this right, but with the knife I begin to wonder if there is something that I can do more than survival. This seed of hope is dangerous. I shake my head, survive. This is my goal. These days have not been as long as the previous camps, and I am not beaten regularly. They are only eating one of us a day, and I am not sure how to interpret this connection with what is going on at night. I have been watching the patrols. So far, it seems that they are more to wonder the city than I would think for a dead place. I see the way that they move. They are concerned about something. I think there is a traitor killed on the first day. Something dangerous is out there. Dangerous to us? Or them? On the third day, my ears twitch back, and I hear the guards in the hall. They want a new translator. For what? They translated the shock out of the sticks well enough. Not for us to decide. Who should we use? I think that one with the little tools in the room is smart. He might already understand a word or two. How do I check? Just walk in behind him and announce that if he doesn't stand up, you're going to hit him. See what he does. I gulped and focused on my current box. This would not be easy. The red one walked in behind me and I heard him speak. You stand before I hit you. My ears twitched and I stopped and I looked up from my work, the red one towering over me. I did not get up. This will be the hard part. Get up, I said. I tried to look confused. I can't do anything to make it clear that I know what will happen. I cannot brace. It must be a full-on... His stick swings out, smashing against the side of my face. The pain is real. The acting is over as I whimper and whine, clutching the side of my face, rolling on the floor. Ugh! He doesn't understand a thing. We'll find another one. The guard leaves the room. My productivity is much lower today with the three swollen eyes. I did not eat well that night, but I will recover. On the fourth day, I am surprised by a small vial in another box. I know the markings of the red ones on the side. It is for healing. I could use it to spare recovery on my eyes, and people would notice. I carefully make it vanish and look around the room once more. Little else happens that day. On the fifth, I move to the next room with the girl. I check it over and feel something strange under one of the tables. There is some sort of door held shut. I can't get anything into the seam until I remember my knife. Careful to only pull it out when the patrol is gone and the girl is busy, I run it along the seam until I hear a click. I barely catch the object that falls out. I already hear Lyrgic whisper to me. It is a death spark. I do not need to wait. I can inflict pain on them now. Ah, but I quickly twitch my ears and I wave the whispers away and tuck the device back into the hidden compartment. It is damage. It will do nothing to them. But it is the least damaged death spark that I've found. The image is burned into my mind even now. I can see the parts that I needed to replace. And then I need a power source. I begin to hunt for the pieces needed to be scavenged the room. Careful to leave the table alone for now and guide her to other places. But on the sixth day, I finally had an idea who was out there and made the Red One spear the night. I heard screaming around midday, which was normal. One of their more aggressive guards had taken a beating for a girl in the small infractions. Perhaps he liked the meat tenderized. I learned not to interfere in such matters. But when I heard him scream, I knew something was different. I rushed to the window and saw the dead guard lying away from the building near the trees. The girl was on the ground, bleeding and crying. But his head was facing backwards and his right arm looked crushed. This was clearly not her work. As the girl threw up in the corner of the room, I scanned the trees. All eyes open. I caught movement for a moment and then focused on the true sight, only to see nothing moving. This is what I couldn't see, but I could see it move. My mind was perplexed by what my eyes were telling it. I saw nothing with heat, but as I closed my other set's eyes and focused on the spark of life, I saw something. It was blurry, but floating. I wasn't sure. But then it was gone. What was it? A ghost to live in the ghost city. A spectre come to haunt the Red Devils. We were pulled from the building quickly after that, and we were all interrogated and the girl was removed, but no one saw anything. I had a perverse pleasure telling the traitor translator that they had brought out. I saw nothing move. It was the truth, and yet a lie strangely thrilling. 
The day after began as if nothing had happened, and I found a part of the death spark, then another hidden away in the corner of the third room. I was close now. I needed one more part of the power source. However, that night I was awakened by my friend. He had approached my bunk and grabbed my knife as I opened my eyes, sensing someone's approach. Even when I saw who it was, I didn't relax. What? I hesitantly croaked, my voice still feeling rusty. You are clearly well suited to the survival. Carissa is sick. Might you have something to help her? I nearly asked who Carissa was. Then I realized it must be the girl. I'd never asked her name, but who else would he be risking his life for? I was very inhesitant. Before, being sick mattered little to me. If she was removed from the group, my job would be easier. One less person to worry about spying on me or betraying me. And yet years ago, before all of this had been truly my closest friend, I carefully gave him the vial that I'd found in the metal box. Half, I hissed out. He nodded and quietly walked back to the center of the room. When he returned, half the vial was empty, and he handed it back. I could still use it for something if I got wounded. And I wanted to warn him not to be so careless with his own life. To risk approaching another in the middle of the night like this. Well, perhaps the others thought this was normal, but if it had been less aware of who I was, I might have attacked him without being woken up like that. The next day, however, I had my own trouble. The guards had found the lock safe hidden upstairs. They had apparently realized that I was good at tools and even brought over a translator to explain to me that I needed to open the safe by the end of the day or I would be punished severely for my failure. I had been so concerned with finding the parts to fix the death spark that I'd forgotten one of the most important rules. Do not become obviously useful. For the first few hours of the day I was calm. I could see both the real safe and the sparks within it guiding my hand as I worked at it, and I opened the door around midday, thinking nothing of it, but when the door was opened, there was another behind it. But this had a lock of buttons, not levers, and the guards seemed upset as they yelled at me for a while before they moved to the other rooms, no longer interested in watching. Figuring that I'd failed, to be honest, I was fairly sure that I would too. I had no idea what to do with the lock to make it like this. I didn't know that the creatures who had built the safe or the ghost city around us what hope did I have? To my surprise, an hour before the day would be over, and perhaps my life. The window opened, and I looked up and I had bite my tongue in order not to cry in surprise. The figure was a dark grey on the outside, and some sort of hard shell. It had two arms, two legs, and looked a little larger than myself. When I opened my other eyes, however, I realized something was wrong. There was no heat. Then I saw the sparks. How many sparks? There was no organic being. The sparks ran in patterns that I had never seen before. It was beautiful. The grey shell was metal. This was some sort of armor. And there was a strange blue light that seeped out of the cracks of the armor that moved on its own. This hollow being, without taking an approach to the safe, pressing the buttons in order that I didn't catch before the second door swung open. From inside the safe, he... It took a bundle of papers before turning to me and handing me a small power source, and the last part I needed. With that, it turned and walked out the back of the window, and I rushed over, but the figure had already gone. When the red ones came in, I was sitting on the open safe, and the inside still full of papers and armor did not take. I was given many rations, but most important to me was hearing that the guards talk about the papers while I was in the room. They had belonged to something called a human. Is that armor this human? I was curious. I saved the stored many of my rations, knowing that I could escape shortly. I crushed the spark of hope in me, though. I would not let my heart be laid. The brain was a tool of survival, a thought cemented in me when my friend approached me again that night. I need that medicine. She is already weak from the poor nutrition and hard work. Half is not enough. Half is enough for any cold. I have not seen her sick. What is this about? I asked, hand my knife, as I watched the man, I hoped, was still my friend in all spectrums. She's pregnant. I was quiet, as I understood the stakes for him now. You moron! You idiot! I growled out. This will surely kill you both. Not if we escape. Surely you have a plan. We must leave soon before they find out. This was rushing things. Survival was not to be rushed. I hated him. 
I hated her. I was so close to working the death spark that they wanted to rush things. The heart must never lead. This is why, but if I did not help, they might take me with them. He is already emotional. How irrational might he get? I need something to cut the blade wire and open up the window glass without much noise. I already have these things, he promised. I finally handed over the vial so that he might take the rest to his wife. Or who I had assumed was his wife officially or unofficially. Tomorrow, get as many rations as you can tell her to be ready halfway through the night. He nodded and was gone. The next day was very nervous for me. I fixed the death spark, hopefully, but no way of checking it truly. I brought the red ones as much as I could scavenge in the day, and was rewarded with more rations yet again. This haul was not as good, and I would have to share it with them before long. Perhaps... Perhaps I will use them to help me escape and then leave them behind. That will weigh me down again. I planned for this now, and when the time came in the night and moved into my corner, as promised, we had tools to cut the glass without a sound. A marvelous device that I could hopefully steal before leaving them. The three of us slipped away and approached the blade wire. He had another set of tools that cut through this, but in the ghost city I would not need it. He could keep those. We moved carefully through the dark streets then. I could lead the way without an issue. I had all eyes open. We were getting close to the building we normally scavenged. When I saw a patrol, I motioned for the others to stop. I needed to get inside and get the death spark. The patrol was nearly past when the girl suddenly threw up. I looked back in horror as she began to get sick on the side of the building that we were hiding behind. The patrol immediately heard it and began moving our way. I looked to my old friend for a moment and then ran. He couldn't grab me in time to get my help. I just ran for the building to leave them both behind. Once I was inside, I ran up to the table with the hidden death spark, retrieving it from its hiding place as I heard yelling outside. I carefully moved back to the door and could see the patrol outside, my friend and his pregnant wife outside begging for their lives. I hesitated. Six red ones and I only had one death spark. And even if I shot one, wouldn't they kill my friend anyway? I couldn't kill them all fast enough. I thought it was over in my brain and I told me what to do. I aimed at my friend and pulled the trigger. But there was no death spark. There was a bright blue light that blinded my true vision, making the gasp and stagger in confusion. The red ones were also gasping out, staggering as if clutching their eyes. I was about to run before they got their bearings when the hollow man returned. Walking calmly out of the woods, he approached the red ones, ripping them apart. Literally, with just his hands despite the half the size of the red ones. As I watched, it was strange, beautiful, and terrifying to observe them across the spectrums. They tried to fight back fire, their sparks, swing, their shock sticks, but the hollow man ignored it all. When the patrol was dead, he approached me, and I dropped the death spark. Then he spoke in our language, which surprised me. I knew you were the one to trust. You are smarter than any prisoner I've seen before. You are a human, I asked, more unsure what to say. I... I am, though not in flesh. The hollow man spoke to me. I was once flesh and blood, a scholar, a protector of the city. When the... I didn't recognize the word at first and realized the name that he had used the red ones was Anatlid. They attacked our planet and they tried to enslave us. But we fought back. They destroyed our fleets and we fought back. They burned our worlds and we still fought back. They could not kill us truly. Knowing the length of the battle, I gifted my spirit. I could tell this with words were limited to our tongue, to this armor. I fight these anatolid even after all this time. Why help me? I help all under the control of them. I do whatever I can to make them hurt. They thought that they were the masters of the stars and all that was within them. But we said no. We showed them that they could be defeated. Though we were beaten, then we were not beaten truly. We will never stop so long as I am even here to fight them. And fight I shall. That is why I need your help. My help, I gasped, confused and surprised by that. What help can I offer a man made of metal? I need you to return to the camp before they realize you're missing. You might help me better fight them here. Despite what you saw, I can still be destroyed. 
They have better eyes around the camp, better death box. But with you inside to act as my own eyes and even ears, I'll be able to hurt them far more. When the human said my mouth dropped open, it took all my strength not to yell back at him, but instead speak frantically. I finally escaped up the years of which I'm, I'm unsure. I held up my arm. I bear the mark of three other camps. I escaped so that I might survive. You wish me to return, to return to that danger. The hollow armor seemed to hesitate. Was that not your plan to help me save the others? You have been through four camps. This I did not know. But how many more camps must your people endure together? How many other planets do they control and use other slaves in their labor? You can survive as three camps in the city, but how many do you leave behind? Would you rather escape and survive, alone and frightened? Or would you return so that you might stand up and help me fight? You risk your life, but you save the lives of all the prisoners in that camp. Do you have no compassion for them? But, but they'll still come for us in the camp falls. The others are... I stammered out, still unsure. Generations ago, I had never been faced with any strong opponents. And they came for us, and we knew to lose, and still we fought. We did not go quiet. We hit them with everything that we had. And while they won, we still also won. For their empire is grumbling. And all this time, they used the same weapons, the same armors as they had back then. They have not grown. They use slaves to saw, which I hear them speak of the others of my kind. Perhaps living, perhaps machines like I. We are returning, and they will fall. Every action we take against them will speed up this process. But even alone, humans will free the galaxy from their rule. No matter the cost, no matter how long it takes. So my question is, will you help me save your people? I blinked at that. I blinked in all spectrums. I looked from the hollow man to my friend holding his crying wife, now amid the dead red ones. I was about to leave them. I had planned on robbing them. My entire life had become nothing but survival. Nothing more. I had called the seemingly empty armor hollow. But as I looked at it with only one set of eyes open, I could see the sparks of life very clearly within that shell. Who then was truly more hollow. This armor, filled with hope and heart, or my own body, filled with flesh and an empty hope or soul, ruled only by my mind. I'm unsure how long I stood unable to speak, until finally the words came to me, tell me what I must do to help. I had a new goal. I would free my people, I would help the human, I would atone for my own lost morality. I would do more than survive. I would achieve, and as I headed back to the barracks loaded with gadgets that the human had given to me, and I was positive that we would win. I would redeem myself through this, and I would no longer be hollow. End of story. And then, my friends, is the end of this Reddit quickie. I hope that you enjoyed. If you'd like to support the channel or the author, all the stuff is down below. And as always, I hope that you guys have a good one, and I'll see you in the next story. Cheers.